Welcome to the Dead Pixel Society podcast, the photo imaging industry's leading news source. Here's your host, Gary Peugeot. The Dead Pixel Society podcast is brought to you by Media Clip, Advertech Printing, and IP Labs. Hello again and welcome to the Dead Pixel Society podcast. I'm your host, Gary Peugeot, and today we're talking to Peter Cotton of Best Sales Talent in Massachusetts. Peter actually began his career in the photo industry, but we're not here to talk about that. First, Peter, just say hello and tell us a little bit about how you got started in sales. Hi, Gary. It's a pleasure to be with you. Gee, I got started in sales at a young age. My dad was in business all of his life, and I used to tag along with him when he'd make uh, client calls, you know, dinner time stuff. I just remember sales from being a very young kid selling greeting cards. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, three corner kind of thing or. Yeah. I moved up. I moved up from that, you know, newspapers. And then uh, I eventually got a job when I was 13 working in a men's clothing store. I was a stock boy, but I watched the salesmen and how they handled customers. So I learned a lot there. And uh, when I graduated from college, even though I uh, wanted to get into photography somehow, I actually met the fellow who was the sales manager for GAF at the time, and he hired me to be a salesman. And that was the first professional sales job I had working for a Fortune 500 company. Mm -hmm. So for those who may not remember, can you kind of talk about GAF in that time period? Because they were a a pretty big player back in in those days. Yeah, GAF uh, had their own film for a long time. In fact, they were the first film pre-Kodak, I guess you could say. The photo finishing industry is very foreign to most people today. They don't know about film because everything is digital. Mm -hmm. But uh, back in the old days, as they say, you would shoot uh, pictures with a camera and you'd send them off to a photo finisher to have them completed and and developed and printed into photographs. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it would take you a week instead of that instant gratification of a digital camera. Right, and what we would do that we had uh, nineteen plants in the United States that developed the film and printed the images. Right, we had hundreds of thousands of fil- rolls of film going through a day. It's incredible how much business there was. Right, it was the heyday of the photo finishing business. Yeah, back in those days, the most popular film format was one twenty six, which was a cartridge that fit into a Kodak Instamatic camera. Mm-hmm. That was represented about eighty-five to ninety percent of the film that we processed. Right. Wow. But you didn't stay there forever, and we're not here really to talk about uh, the old days of photo finishing. But we're here to talk about sales and sales recruitment, which is right. what your business is now. So, why did you transition to that business? As I mentioned, my dad had been in his own business all of his life, uh, mm-hmm. being free person, so to speak, and mm-hmm. being on your own and Mm-hmm. Uh, not having to answer to anybody, uh, it really appealed to me. And a, a lot of things go on in corporate life that just aren't really great. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, well, you, uh, again, you went from uh, basically you out of school to a Fortune 500 company. And that was a pretty big jump. Yeah, I went from sales to sales management with them. But you know, there's a lot of politics involved, and people make promises they can't keep, and. Mm-hmm. Uh, you get blocked promotionally for one reason or another. And you can't get a raise. I would right. rather be in command myself. So I was looking for a business to get involved with. And oddly enough, at that time when I was in uh, Pittsburgh as a sales manager, I met my then wife, still married today for 47 years. She worked for Kodak. Mm-hmm. So the two of us had sort of a merger, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we got married and decided we were going to start our own business together as a husband and wife team. Okay. And we bought a franchise to Management Recruiters International, okay. which is now known as MRI Network. Okay. And uh, they had a division called Sales Consultants. Mm-hmm. And I purchased the franchise for Sales Consultants in Rhode Island. Okay. Uh, it was the first state franchise, the only state franchise, in fact. Because mm-hmm. it's not a big state. Right. You buy five little tiny counties and you got the whole state. I ran sales consultants of Rhode Island for 36 years. We were in the business, as I still am today, of finding and placing sales, sales management, and marketing talent with our client companies. Mm -hmm. So 
A lot of people talk about, you know, how different it is today to find people, recruit people, keep people. What do you think, has it really changed or is it just, you know, kind of an ageism thing where people are saying, well, that's not how it was when I was a kid? Because it seems like it's a little bit of both. Yeah, a lot has changed. I've seen a massive change in the time I've been in business. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's a candidate-driven market right now. They're in Mm -hmm. control of what's going on. There are close to two jobs for every person who's looking for one. Right. And companies are finding it very hard to find people because their competitors are snatching up the top people very quickly. Mm -hmm. Uh, They don't drag their feet. They don't take weeks to interview. And then there's also the quality issue. Finding really quality, qualified Mm -hmm. candidates is very difficult. What about the sales career? Is that something that, that appeals to young people today? Because it's my perception that a lot of younger people don't want the risk related to sales, right? They want more of a secure environment. Um, do you, are you seeing that as well? Not so much. Um, mm-hmm. I've okay. seen schools pop up that offer sales as a course and you can you know, take many courses in salesmanship, et cetera. Selling is a very attractive role for someone right out of college, particularly Mm -hmm. if you get trained in professional selling technique, if you have a good company behind you, if you can believe in the product, you like the product, you get passionate about it. Right. um, You get a lot of uh, benefits, you know, you get a salary, you get maybe commissions or bonuses or both. If you're working for a big company and they expect you to go all around a territory all day long, mm-hmm. they'll give you a company car. Right. Um, At a certain level. I mean, people don't usually walk into the company car situation. Uh, sometimes they do. Mm-hmm. Okay. Depends on the, depends on the company, what, what they're right. doing. Do you think a sales candidate should look for... Uh, something they're interested in as sort of a, a category or a product category, or should they just focus on their sales techniques? Well, you got to focus on your sales techniques, regardless of what category right. you go into. You know, you, you could probably get a lot more excited about something if you have a deep interest in it. I was right. very interested in photography, so mm-hmm. that fit well. Mm-hmm. But a lot of people look at companies differently today. They want to get with a a leader. They want to get with somebody who's uh, coming out with the latest and greatest products and services. Right. Um, Okay. And that that's appealing to them. Mm -hmm. So in the photo industry today, you know, you've got your traditional camera stores, you got your photo labs and people like that. And some of them have uh, trouble recruiting, Uh, whether it's because like you said, they're not seen as cool or something like that, how would you suggest that they recruit more sales staff or or be better suited for sales people? The retail side of the photo business? Yeah, yeah, retail or the photo labs, for example. Well, there are no photo labs left. <laughs> <laughs> well, they are, but they're very different than the photo finishers you remember. But they're, yeah, they're the, under- An entire laboratory can be replaced by a machine the size of a large office printer. <laughs> that is That is true. So anyway, you're saying, so how would they go about retaining and uh, recruiting salespeople? Well, what are the things they should be looking for? Maybe outside of their own business. I don't work on jobs in the retail sector, first of all. Okay. Okay, good. Okay. I'm only involved in professional selling jobs. I would guess that it's from a management point of view, in order to attract and retain people, you have to be um, empathetic. You have to be uh, a leader. You have to be uh, passionate about your product mm-hmm. and your service. Mm-hmm. And you have to get people excited about it, enthusiastic about right. it. Right. And if they are, and they, you know, feel comfortable with you and what's going on, they'll, they'll join. And then to keep them, you have to reward them and rec- recognize them. Well, mm-hmm. in reverse order, recognize right. them and then reward them. Let's say you've got, let's say an employer has a candidate in the pipeline. What's the best way for them to interview the candidate? What are some of the the, the ways they should approach that interview? Mm. Well, the biggest problem today is that most people don't know how to interview. The candidate? They, no, that interview. no, the employer. Okay. So what do they need to know? Candidates do a great job of interviewing in the most part because they read everything that's available on how to interview. 
but employers don't do that for some reason. And they default to the kind of interview that they were given when they were looking for a job. Right. Um, I would say the best thing that should be doing is using behavioral identification interviewing techniques, Mm -hmm. which are questions that elicit more than a yes or a no uh, or an opinion. Right. Like if you ask somebody, where do you want to be in five years? That would be an opinion. Wouldn't make any difference uh, how effective they'd be in their job. But if you ask them, tell me about a time when you had a difficult uh, boss that you were working with. How did you handle it? Mm-hmm. Describe your describe it to me, or right. tell me about a time when you. I'm assuming we're talking about experienced salespeople now. Sure. Tell me about a time when you had a major account and they were going to go to the competition, and you mm-hmm. had a chance to save it. Mm-hmm. What did you do? Who were the people involved? What mm-hmm. was the result? Mm-hmm. So it's asking questions about a situation, what action you took, and what the result was that you obtained Mm -hmm. Uh, past behavior is a pretty good indication of future behavior. Okay. So if a a person shines in how they deal with people, how they solve problems uh, and sell solutions, then you probably have a better candidate. So in some cases, people, employers like see somebody they like and just, you know, hire them or offer them a job or something like that. Other times they create a position description and find someone to fill that. Which do you think is more successful? Hiring, you know, the candidate you can create a job for or creating a position you can find a candidate for? You got to have the position first. If mm-hmm. you hire someone just because you like them, mm-hmm. which is a personality thing, mm-hmm. what are they going to do when they come to work for you? Mm-hmm. Is it defined? Yeah. So if, it, if it isn't defined, they'll be running in circles. Right. Kind of like having your one foot nailed to the floor. Where are you going? Mm-hmm. Right. So if you had a job description, then you'd be able to match a person's skills against the job description. They have right. the skills, they can mm-hmm. do the job. Mm-hmm. Okay. Because there seems to be like, always from what I see in the photo industry, there is a lot more of the, uh, you know, personality yeah, uh, that's trust. because the photo industry is an incestuous one. <laughs> everybody knows everybody else. They all go to the same meetings. Right. They all talk at cocktail hour, and it, it becomes a buddy-buddy network, which mm-hmm. is not the best way to hire people. Okay. So why is it so hard for employers to, to, to find people these days? Is it just because it's a candidate's market, or are they doing something, or what could they do better? They're not doing all the things they need to do. You know, the do-it-yourself method is complicated. Mm -hmm. Uh, You have to, you know, write a job description. You have to post it somewhere on the internet or on LinkedIn or on Indeed or something like that, or a niche job board. And you have to sort through the hundreds and hundreds of resumes that come in that are absolutely not qualified for the job, but they saw the title or they saw what the industry was where they saw what the money was for the job, and they just apply, even right. though they, they're not a fit. They know they're not a fit, but right. it's so easy to apply. All right. they do is see the job and they click it. Right. Right. And their resume goes electronically. They don't, have, don't even have to lick a stamp. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the employer has to deal with that, and there's an awful lot of candidates to sort through. And unless they know how to interview properly, they're going to mm-hmm. miss a lot if they take too long to hire, you know, too many steps in the interviewing process. Candidates mm-hmm. lose interest. Right. Uh, candidates get picked off by another company who's hiring mm-hmm. and moving faster. Mm-hmm. As I mentioned before, it's a it's almost a speed process. Yeah, I've seen some of that criticism of the hiring process these days where people, you know, there's an electronic process where you either apply online or fill out a uh, a massive amount of forms, which is just crazy. Yeah, and there's some people... instances, Gary, on that point, some places they say, please upload your resume in PDF or Word. And then yeah. the next page on the website job application is a bunch of fields. And it says, please fill in these fields. Exactly. Like I'm, I'm doing the resume all over again. Right. That exactly. loses candidates like crazy. Yeah. Why I wonder why systems are built like that because it it because does they're built by they're built by software people. 
They're not, but, they're not built to hire. They're built to screen out. Right. So, well, that's part of the thing. So then people go into, they, let's say they have a Zoom. Now it's very common to have a Zoom interview, right? right. And then there's always like, it seems to be like for a higher level position, there's two or three more steps, it seems to be like before an offer is made, where you got to meet everybody on the team, and then you got to meet the next people up and the people below and everything like that. Does that really find the best candidate or is it just find the most persistent candidate? <laughs> it's probably a combination of both. <laughs> um, not so much persistent, but patient would be yeah. the word. The problem with that you know, uh, as I said before, is there are too many steps in the process. Mm -hmm. They can't all be looking for different things. They have to be looking for the same thing. So if they coordinate their efforts, maybe even have a panel interview, have two right. or three people sit in on the interview at the same time. Yep. Because to ask somebody to come in for an interview and then he leaves or she leaves, and mm -hmm. then they invite him back a week later, and mm -hmm. then they invite him back another week later, you know, it's a lot of back and forth into the office. Right. Uh, it's a waste of time. And the time in between, people lose interest. Right. So what do you think about panel interviews? Are those valuable, uh, really? Or is this just more of a, a way for management to make it seem like they're getting more people involved? Uh, it depends on how it's done. But uh, if it's done in a friendly, mm -hmm. casual kind of way, it's a lot more comfortable. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen panel interviews that are very rigid and they are stern mm -hmm. and they're tough in their questions. And they, it's like the person's put on the firing line. Right. That's not a way to hire somebody. Right. But if it's a good conversation where that you can elicit the information you need to determine skills, talent, desire, mm -hmm. that's a big part. Mm -hmm. If they don't have the desire to do the job, they'll never do it well. Right. Right. So if you can elicit all these things through a good conversation with multiple people involved, you get a lot more accomplished at the same time. So what are the top traits that you think an employer should look for in a salesperson? Stay with us. We'll be right back. Photo retailers, energize your sales with Share Me Chat, the proven texting platform. Using chat to text on your website keeps your customers connected and buying. See us at Pro and IPI to find out why dealers using ShareMe Chat close more sales without adding staff. Find out more at shareme.chat. Persistence, uh, ability to handle objections mm -hmm. and overcome them. I have a word, it's called spizzerinctum. <laughs> it's it's a combination of a lot of things but it comes down to desire spunk an attitude of positivity um hunger there's a whole bunch of things that go into a salesperson being a hunter or a farmer of course but they have to have uh you know a good attitude about life about people mm -hmm. the most important thing is their ability to handle rejection Mm -hmm. You don't get a yes on every call. Right. So so when you're when you're assessing that as an empl a potential employer, how how do you kind of feel that out? Because you know, that's sort of a a character trait that may or may not be apparent on the resume or even in the first interview. Never on the resume. It couldn't <laughs> possibly be. Uh, I deal with rejection well. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh it's more a situation of asking the right questions. Mm -hmm. Again, behavioral identification questions to mm -hmm. elicit skill traits, not traits, but talents. How right. the person answers the questions, their delivery will mm -hmm. tell you a lot about them and whether or not they're even enthusiastic. Right. Okay. Right? Um, you, you'll learn to do that. It takes time to assess talent in people and do it effectively. Mm -hmm. And I've been a recruiter for 47 years. Mm -hmm. I've, I can't even begin to imagine how many people I've interviewed by phone, by Zoom or in person. And every one of those interviews is different. You learn something new about people in each mm -hmm. instance. Mm -hmm. And some people shine, others don't. Mm -hmm. Just the way it is. So what are the traits 
of let's say you're hiring for a sales manager position, like, you know, somebody's going to manage a sales force. That's different than a sales person. What are the traits you're looking for there? Well, if you're looking for traits, you first have to look at the experience. Where have they been a sales manager before? Mm -hmm. uh, if you're hiring somebody who's a salesman and promoting them to a sales manager in a new role at a new company, mm -hmm. that's very difficult. It's going to be a, a big downer to the sales force because you didn't promote anybody from within. Right. Now they're going to be managed by somebody who doesn't know their business, mm -hmm. or their industry, and he's going to be the sales manager. That doesn't fly very well. Mm -hmm. But if you're interviewing somebody who has sales management experience and you want to have them become a sales manager with you, I would look for leadership skills, mm -hmm. um, the ability to motivate people a track record where they've taken a team and done well with them sure but they haven't had a lot of attrition mm -hmm. where they've increased revenue or increased profits mm -hmm. uh, you got to look at the track record to see if they're good so one of the ways that people are 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 getting jobs or finding jobs is through through recruiters as an employer how should a relationship with a recruiter go is should you use the same one every time or have a team of recruiters you use? Or what do you think is the best way to, to manage that process? I think an employer who develops a relationship with a professional recruiter who trusts them because mm -hmm. they've given them information on what they're looking for and the, and the recruiter uh, listens and he presents candidates who have those types of skills. He does okay. a good job. Uh, they should go back to them because they don't have to reinvent the wheel on explaining who they are and what they do. A recruiter should be looked at as a consultant and as an extension of the company because okay. a recruiter is going to go out in the marketplace and rave about this company, about how good they are and what a great place it is to work mm -hmm. and uh, have a great opportunity that they're looking to fill. So it's it should be looked upon as a consultant they should not be looked upon as a transactional agent, mm -hmm. like a you know, employment agency was the word I'm looking for, I guess. Right. A recruiter is many steps above the agent who works in an employment agency. Okay. Those people are called career counselors or counselors. Mm -hmm. They don't counsel anything. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so on the other end of that is you know, how do candidates work with recruiters? Because there's another relationship there. I mean, the recruiter's right. working on behalf of the employer, but the candidate needs to have some sort of skills there too, some sort of appeal there. If a candidate wants to develop a relationship with a, with a recruiter, it precedes the first phone call. Mm -hmm. Might send the uh, recruiter information on something that's happening within the industry, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, they may touch base uh, asking for a connect through LinkedIn. Okay. But when they do talk to that recruiter, they have to be honest with them about where they've been, what they're doing and where they want to go. And the mm -hmm. recruiter will do his best to help them. Uh, not all candidates who come to a recruiter will get placed. Right. Uh, recruiters place less than five to 10% of those people who come at really? them. That's that, that low. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, because most recruiters are spending their time recruiting people who are right. in the job now, happy, productive, thought well of, not looking for another job, but we're going to recruit them away mm -hmm. to a better opportunity. Um, we start that conversation off with, um, uh, if I could tell you, like, if I could show you an opportunity that would improve your life, would you be interested? Right. Or, you know, something along those lines. I don't want to give away my secrets. Um, <laughs> They, a good candidate will respond to that. Right. So recruiters mostly place people who aren't looking for a job. Those are considered applicants. Mm -hmm. And those that aren't looking for a job are considered passive. And those are recruits. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you're actually, as a recruiter, you're actually looking for people who may not be actually actively looking for a job. That's the most important role of a recruiter. Wow. Okay. That's how we fill jobs without those in the marketplace already. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What percentage of jobs in the type of 
positions you recruit for, you know, the upper level or are even public, right? I'm, or even people are even aware of. Aren't, aren't most of those jobs not even listed anywhere? Correct. Mm -hmm. Most employers don't want to let the competition know they've got a weakness somewhere. I'm talking mm -hmm. about sales jobs, right? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, specifically. Yeah. You don't want to open territory to be blasted all over the marketplace. So your competition goes in there and snaps up your company, your accounts. Right. So, yeah, you keep it under the rug, so to speak. So discretion in that relationship between the recruiter and the employer is key, right? Because Correct. Yeah, I mean, that, that's pretty impressive. So what do you think the outlook is over the next couple of years for and the employment trends? Are we still going to be looking for in this, uh, this sort of valley we're in where people are just, just looking for people to fill spots? Or, or is, do you think that's going to um, uh, dry up or compress or be more like it traditionally was? Are we? Is this something we're going to look at forever? Or is this the new normal or what? When you say traditionally was, you're talking about an employer market. Right. There's tons employer. of people applying. Well, right. you got to ask yourself, why are there tons of people applying? They're mm -hmm. all out of work. Right. Now, right. if you were a company who had a sales force and you had accountants and you had bookkeepers and you had warehouse guys and truck drivers, where are you going to cut first when times are bad? Mm -hmm. You're going to cut your sales force? No. That's the worst thing you could do. Right, right, right. So if you've got a salesperson on the market out of a job looking for a job, you got to ask yourself, how good is he? Right. Because if he was really good, they wouldn't have let him go. That's the employer market. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So... Uh, I don't think it's going to be much different. There's going to be, and there's continuing to be, uh, a gap between the number of people available to fill jobs, Right. period, because the baby boom is over. Younger people are waiting longer to get married. They're having fewer children. Mm -hmm. College is becoming so astronomically expensive. A lot of people aren't going, mm -hmm. going into trades. Mm -hmm. Or they're starting a career without a college education. Right. You know, so um, the number of people that are going to be qualified to fill positions is going to continue to drop. Right. And it's going to be harder and harder for an employer to find people. That's why recruiters come into the picture. They could do the job. So if someone wanted to uh, reach out to your company to learn more, where would they go? They can go to our website, which is bestsalestalent.com. Mm -hmm. Or if they wish to uh, contact me by phone, my number is 401-737-3200. Don't be confused by a 401 area code. That's just Rhode Island. Even <laughs> though I'm in Massachusetts, it's a VoIP telephone. I can okay. plug it in anywhere. It'd be in Rhode Island. Well, thank you, Peter, for the trip through the past of early photo finishing, but also for your uh, expertise and your sales recruitment talent. I appreciate you sharing that with us and best wishes. Thanks, Gary. It was a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for listening to the Dead Pixel Society podcast. Read more great stories and sign up for the newsletter at www.thedeadpixelssociety.com.